And how are all of you <clears throat> here? I have been asked to speak through this woman. <clears throat> for all of you here are interested in the world development of your country's policies as I was interested in my country's policies. being president was my task and my responsibility in the 60s. My pet phrase, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country was actually written by one of my ghost writers. And now I'm a ghost writer, a sort. You now know who I am. Some people called me Jack. I like to be called Jack. It's the way I like to relate to my people, to people on a person-to-person -person level. I like being in a rocking chair. <clears throat> it's been... 30 years almost since my death and I have been in various realms of training since my death so that I could eventually come here to talk to people through channelers. I may sound funny for I am just learning now how to operate the vehicle. Ascordia is the being who I have been introduced to in my later training period. She reminds me a bit of my mother, Rose, who is a strong woman, a very strong woman. And I had surrounded myself with strong women. They had to be, for I was in my way, very capricious, personally speaking, very emotionally capricious. I was a ladies' man, and I was proud of it. Yet, I also surrounded myself with stabilizing influences. My wife, Jacqueline, is also a very strong woman. We often had power plays, power plays not only in the bedroom, but in the boardroom. She often guided me in my decisions of a national, per national character and purpose. Jacqueline would have been a good president. I was a figurehead, in a sense. I took on the values of the early 60s and the late 50s, the values of a promising American venture capitalism, a promise of a booming economy, the promise of a youthful and energizing aspect to American society that I symbolized this energy, this vitality, this opportunity that was available then has long since disappeared, in a sense, my death. It was the optimism of a fresh adolescent. It was the hope and faith of a child just coming into its own maturity so that it knew no bounds, it knew no distinctions either, as I did not know either in some ways. It was an America that was ready to leap forward 
into a time of great progress and social progress and social continuity. It was the great leap forward. It was my sense of the word that carried itself through in many a policy and many a piece of legislation. I worked through the ranks of politics. I knew politics well. I understood how to play the old boy network game. And that, I'm afraid to say also, was my undoing. For there were elements then in the old boy network that were corrupt, corrupted far beyond the visions that I had of a government, of a world order. The term world order is not new. It was used back in the 50s. It was used in Eisenhower's days, perhaps amongst the generals and the heads of state. And in the State Department, it was a well-known term. It was an alternate plan, in fact, created if there was the threat of communism to take over the United States. There was then contingency plans to create what we called a new world order that was anti-communist in thrust and unifying in purpose, but it too was besieged by corrupt influences and forces that used it then for their own purposes of creating a totalitarian regime and dictatorship in the world itself. I was aware of these influences and I named names and I called them upon the floor and I fired a few of them and they in turn retaliated with my death. I say this to you for there is now a resurgence of interest in my death, a resurgence of interest in the 60s a resurgence of interest in the idea of a world order. I just introduced these theories then, these understandings. I just introduced them. I was not given much time to express them completely. I was a hot shot in the office, in the White House, and I was cocky in all senses of the word, so that I knew no limits either. I did not know when to say stop, when to say no in my efforts to clean house. As a consequence, I dealt with the mafia, with the mob, with the drugs traffic that already existed, that was just waiting to come into the United States. I was aware of Vietnam. I was aware of the possibility of war in the Middle East. These are not new agendas. I want all of you to know this. These are old agendas that were created as a result of the Cold War. These were spots already pickin', picked by generals, by leaders in the Department of State that were predicted to be hot spots in the continuing Cold War. We knew this in advance. And we knew then that our purpose was to stymie, to stave off, to circumvent the possibility of war or conflict as much as possible, but we knew that there was an inevitability for such clashes as they represented then the forces that worked then in the major powers between the United States and Russia and China. Third world countries were just pawns then between the United States and Russia and China. Undeveloped countries such as the Middle Eastern ones at the time that I was at office were just beginning to become focal points in the Cold War chess game. And yes, the government did work with aliens. 
And yes, I knew about it. And yes, I did not tell the public. And Kissinger knew about it. However, again, it was a difficult decision for me not to talk, not to discuss these issues with the American public, for I was interested in disclosing as much of the goings-on for the American people as possible. I wanted to cultivate their trust. And I did cultivate their trust. But I did not cultivate enough trust in the office itself. Too many vested interests in divided parties. Too many self-serving technocrats and bureaucrats. I knew how to play politics, but I didn't know how to play once I got into the White House, which has its own agenda. This may be of interest to you. Four, it is a phenomenon that I have observed then since my death that all men who come into the office of president change radically, change in their outlook, change in their procedural policies are beset and besieged by forces that are totally beyond their control. More so and more so. Until Nixon, until Bush, the men were of good intent, were of honest intent, could not be empowered enough to take care of business in the White House itself. There was then a need for a Nixon, a need for a Bush, who were already were devious, who already knew how to play devious games. I say this because it is important to understand and, nev and never to underestimate the powers of the office of the White House and also the surrounding vested interests and loyalties to then a world order that impinge themselves on the goodwill of the office of the White House. If I were you then, I would seek to have an investigative committee created then in the House and the Senate as to the purposes for certain committees and trust funds developed over the years. These funds are siphoned off then into secret societies and secret works for this world order as understood then by you, as expressed by you through President Bush. He is only naming the surface. He is only giving you a surface expression that does not indicate the depths of involvement of major businesses and corporations, major banks around the world, major communication and energy centers. All of these then are being slowly consolidated through interlocking directorates, through transference of funds into a unified network of control and domination. I say this to you, not to frighten you, but to let you know the importance of opening up to the public the information now that is being offered by those brave souls who have come out of the woodwork to express their indignation and their horror at the way the White House has been trampled upon by these corrupt influences, those very self-same influences that had me shot and killed. The coming changes in 1991 are rather predictable in the light of this information. The war will continue. The war will escalate in terms of the use of military funding, the use of soldiers, the use of equipment. There will be a downslide in our economy, a recession. There will be a sense of doom and gloom as purported in the news and the media. There will be a concerted effort towards negativity because as the morale of the United 
States, of the people of the United States, is turned downwards, is made to feel apathetic and hopeless. It is at this point that the forces of the world order can begin to brainwash and manipulate public opinion. My word then to you is to not become depressed, not to become dismal, not to take on the trappings then of media coverage, for it's distorted. This year then is a very important year for all of you to take your choice, to take your stand about what you can do for your country. This is a political year. This is the year in which politics makes sense again, as it perhaps never made sense before. It is a year in which your vote, in which your stance, in which your letters, in which your outcries, in which your demands are needed to be heard in the White House. I cannot be more emphatic about this point. It is crucial now for you to see yourselves as Americans, truly Americans, and nothing else but Americans. No longer are you white or black, male or female, poor or rich, but all Americans with a common cause to uphold and defend the freedoms of your constitutional rights, the freedoms as guaranteed rather by your constitutional rights, the right to freedom of speech, freedom of the press, will be attempted to be taken away. The censorship of the media now is just the beginning of a general censorship effort then on the part of forces in the government. Uphold then your freedom of speech, your freedom to write and think and to say what you feel is true. As you have said in today's gathering, your primary experience is your truth for you. Uphold this truth for yourself as your forefathers upheld the truths then of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence to be true. Take on the task of redeclaring your independence from the forces of greed, the forces of coercion, the forces of oppression. This was my task to begin the effort. This was my task. All of you are very intelligent and inspired individuals. All of you can take the moment in hand to write letters to sign petitions, to have meetings, to discuss the nature then of the very way in which you are legislated to and by and for your representatives. Question them. Question them. Question their motives. Question their intentions. Ask them, what are you doing for my community at this point in time, as we represent then the needs and the values of our community, question them in this fashion. You need to retaliate in the sense of reciprocating the energies as they are being leveled upon you now by the war, by the forces of war, reciprocate then with the force of peace in the sense that you demand to know what is going on. You demand to know the truth. For the truth 
creates your primary experience, creates the world's primary experience. And the truth, as many a person would say, shall set you free. 1991 recapitulates then patterns from the last 30 years. You will see a repeat then of general trends that have occurred in the last 30 years to be repeated in a way that indicates its own death, the end of a pattern. However, it cannot die gracefully unless you allow it to die in peace, unless you counter the tendencies with new thoughts, new inclinations, new needs. What is needed then in the year 1991 are coalitions of groups at the grassroots level to, one, challenge those forces in the White House that censor the truth. Two, to create for yourselves community-based organizations that represent the value systems of your particular area so that you have a clear and free understanding of that which you represent, that which you symbolize, that which you can ask for in your representatives in the House and the Senate. Create declarations, if you will, of values for yourself. Congregate amongst yourselves to create unity and order through a common ordering of values. The value for peace, for example. The value for non-exploitation of people and the environment. The value for self-autonomy, self-regulation within local political systems. The value of free energy, free and clear of any ties to greed, ties to organized crime, ties to big business. These then are the three or four main purposes for these coalitions to gather about. I have made my points today for you. I have not come into this body to express to you who I am now or what I am doing now. I have come into this body to give flesh and form to my thoughts and feelings about the Gulf crisis that you understand is occurring now in the Middle East, that occurred in Vietnam, that occurred in Cambodia, that occurred in Thailand, that occurred in South America, that occurred in Korea. These are all areas, again, that were pinpointed years ago as being those areas that would flare up in the Cold War. The Cold War continues, though the games have changed. The game plan has changed, and the rules have changed, and the opponents have changed. The Cold War continues. Your leaders will not change until you change public opinion, until you change the very fabric and nature of public opinion, until you make it clear then to those who are in office what you value and what you demand then as the bottom line in government, the bottom line. Many a bill, many a referendum has been pushed through because those in the Congress and the Senate do not know what their bottom line is. They can be swayed. Their opinions can be changed. They are indecisive. They are not sure of their values. And they then only can represent what's out there, what is out there in America, to some extent. The system has its faults, 
but it also has its great glories, of which I have personified the glorious possibilities of our country to be a figurehead for the world of progress and development. And we can be again. And this is the year that is crucial to change the tempo of the times, to change the efforts on the part of those influences in our government to centralize power into a few hands, a few corrupt and evil, evil hands. Saddam Hussein is one of many individuals who could possibly rise to power in these various centers in the world. He was chosen to then play the part of the bad guy. He, in fact, is a puppet controlled by other forces in the CIA and CIA-related organizations. Let someone here explain that. Are CIAs controlling Saddam Hussein? Wake up and smell the bacon. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. How could that happen? I don't CIA is all over the world. The American, the yeah. Americans mm-hmm. are Central fighting with themselves. Agency. Well, do you want to fill us in, JFK, with the background on how that occurred? When the CIA is so ubiquitous? The CIA is ubiquitous, as you put it because it is in the hands of a certain gathering of men who control the banks and the economies of the world and so have stationed the CIA in strategic points to ensure that there would be certain economic happenings, economic occurrences periodically that would create recessions and depressions as well as the opposite. Governments that were in fact sponsored or nurtured by our government in the 70s and 80s as a result of the economic upswing everything was well funded including the CIA so that it is a well funded well organized international organizational front at this point in time. Did the driver shoot you? Yes, he did. Did Jackie know that? Yes, she does. Were the major players behind your assassination? If you can give that information. There are some people who I can name, but others I cannot. For it would be too controversial at this time for your best interest. John, who has funded the CIA? What families are behind it? There are elements of the Costa Nostra and the Mafia involved. There are elements, of course, of government funding through, as I've said before, funds established by the Congress and Senate, especially in the Senate. There are secret fundings as given to the White House directly by certain leaders of corporations. You will find this information also in the hands of those individuals such as those who are now talking openly about the collusion of forces in the government with those that are against the best interests of the American people, but who represent the best interests of, quote, national security. Bob Oshler is an important figure then now to listen to. What about William Cooper? William Cooper is less important for he will dilute 
the validity or credibility of his information with his emphasis on our working with aliens. For this will not sit well yet with public opinion. If he were to just focus then on the information he has about government agencies working together along with the Majestic 12, as you know it, then he would have more credibility, as Bob Oshler does. Yes, John. I uh, just wanted to say that uh, what I've heard the last 20 minutes or so has been very moving. And I uh, want to thank you. Um, my question is, uh, is it appropriate, cause, uh, based on the kind of work you know that we've been doing here for the last three and a half years, to show the videotape and disseminate some other information in regards to William Cooper and others? Yes, it would not hurt then your efforts, but understand then how to discriminate what will be credible in these times where most people still find the thought of communication with extraterrestrials rather repulsive, so that you do not want to discredit your work here with anything that would lead to repulsion or abhorrence by the general public. So, um, I have a question. I feel like, um, if, if you, if you wanted to get all this stuff out in the open and everything, and they retaliated by killing you, well, I mean, I don't, how, are we just supposed to, are we just supposed to do this anyway, even though, I mean, I'm sort of, I'm, it's not that I'm afraid somebody's going to shoot me, but, but I don't know, I mean, should I just, should I just try to, should we just, should we really try to expose this stuff anyway? I mean, aren't they going to try to kill us or? I don't, I don't uh, know. It's, it's, it's not legitimate. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm, I don't want anybody to come shoot me. It is not so developed that they have everyone, every single individual in the United States on some master computer file yet so that you would not be subject to the whims or forces of the CIA and the other attached agencies, or the FBI for that matter. What we say, what I say, is it would be important to just form coalitions or groups of discussion so that you can make it clear to yourselves what you stand for and what you demand then from your representatives. For they in their turn still have the power to make domestic and foreign policy to some extent. And that extent is what you need to maintain in this game of power and privilege. Is there a correlation between the CIA and the Israeli government as well? To some extent, yes. And has that also made, had an impact on this war in reference to America's um, participation in protecting quite a the Israeli nation? Yes. Is um, the state of Switzerland also somehow involved in that whole business of war making? And Through the banks. And the government knows about that? And to some extent. Does this new world order transcend national identities? In other words, like it uh, goes across America or England and has its own existence apart from the governments of individual countries? Yes. Could you go into that a little bit? Maybe you... I have already. What I have said here, then, is enough for you to begin with. For the details and the intricacies will be revealed to you through these discussions and videos and transcripts. It is not my position at this time to divulge the, de the details. It is my position and my responsibility to divulge to you the need for you to take responsibility for the developments in the White House and in our government at this time. Excuse me, Jack. Is there a strong probability that this will come out okay or come out in the best possible way for um, Americans or anyone who believes in freedom and uh, freedom of speech and whatnot? Is there a strong probability that this will work itself out? 
Yes, there are strong probabilities for either way. So I am saying to you at this time to deter that one probability would to allow yourself to gather together in such a fashion. I personally do not know what the outcome will be in the sense that whether the new world order will be established on a very public platform or not. It may always be underhanded. It, all, it, will all, it may always be secret to some extent. But the outcome of the world order will not be. And it, there will be patterns developed. And it will lead eventually to major disruptions of economies in the third world countries, major recessions in the United States and already in Russia, periodic fighting and bloodbaths then in those areas as already established, periodic wars then in those same self-same areas. That may lead, if not tampered with, if not checked, to a third and final world war. That is the ultimate outcome of this game by those forces now operating in collusion with each other to create this world order. What do you mean by final? <laughs> How final? How much more final can we get than a world war? Well, we general. The world, the war to end all wars, the war to end all life in this case. Jerry, um, I have a different questions quick. Are you aligned with the white, uh, Great White Brotherhood? No. Jack? Yes. Um, do you believe you chose to die at that time, and if so, what would the reasons have been? I did not consciously choose to die at that time. It was decided that I needed to die at that time, for it was thought that it would trigger public opinion to rally around certain issues in a stronger way to then lead to certain developments in the line of government so that there would be less of a problem with the tendencies that were developing at that time. There were many deaths at that time, as you know, not only of my brother and of Martin Luther King, but of famous rock stars and other famous pers public figures, all of which had been determined to be important to do at that time. However, if I had a free will in that moment, I would not have wanted to die. No. I would not have wanted to die. Jack, um, when I first found out it was you, I got all mad because I've always hated you, because I've always hated all the people who love you, because I assumed that for you to become president, you were just as corrupt as the rest. After all, uh, your father was uh, apparently a dope, a dope smuggler. And he and he must have you know, he was like part of the whole uh, rich financial families that, that got us into this mess. So now that I've heard you, I, I now have changed my opinion. I believe that you are a good man. But how did but how being good does anyone get to be president? And how did you turn from from the evil of your father and his cronies to truly being a good person? I was very shrewd. I used the contacts of my father to get into certain places of power. And as I stepped up in my power, I began to show more of my true nature or side. However, there were times when I had to play the forces against each other or to collide with them or collude with them briefly in order to gain more power in the long run to do or enact rather those things that I wanted to do for the, for the country. There were rumors, of course, that I had deals or making deal, dealings with the mafia, dealings with the drugs scene, dealings with then those forces that I have mentioned. And I had to deal with them in a way that called them upon the rug in a matter of speaking. As I became president, as I've said to you, I became very assured of my ways and turned the tables on many a person who were then very surprised about that. They weren't at all prepared for the turning around that I made once I entered the office.
Jack, why was your brother assassinated? He also knew a great deal, and he was even more vocal than I, and he had more alliances than with the civil rights movement and those subversive elements that the CIA thought to be eradicated eventually down the line. He also had dealings with the mob that were more, shall we say, interconnected than I did. How does Oswald feel if he's innocent? He was a pawn in the game of my death. He was also, shall we say, not all there in his head. He was not a mentally stable man to begin with. He would have gone on to take on other um, opportunities to kill or to subvert in some fashion. If it was not uh, me, it would have been someone else that they would have given him to pick off, so to speak, in that he would have thought he was going to do that. He was a pawn. He was mentally enfeebled. He was drugged. He was imprisoned. He was sometimes tortured then in his experience then with the CIA and the FBI and the other agencies involved in my death. This was also to prevent him from taking on a bigger role of actually killing me, but to believe in his own mind that he was responsible. Does he believe that in his own mind? Not now, but then he did. Jack, have you had opportunities to uh, talk with the founding fathers of our country? No, I have not. I got a question for you, John. I came in late. Did you discuss the purpose of this current war? Who was behind it? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, did you discuss anything about what's going to happen with the economy? Yes, I did. Uh, did you talk about our tight money situation and who is uh, controlling the money? Yes, I did. Uh, did you talk about the uh, gigantic computer underground in Utah that's going to have uh, all the information pertaining to each individual here in the United States? I did not talk about details. As I've said before, I intimated them, and I give that opportunity to then you and others like yourself. Jack, yes. how, can, how can we make um, this information that we just got from you? Um, known to the public without necessarily telling them that it was a channel and that it was you who told us all of that. It seems to be important information, but it's connected with, with this channeling issues that many people don't believe in, so it's kind of difficult. And we would rather keep it that way for some time so that what you can say is that you heard through a channeling this, ex this information, but you know what you need to do. And I don't tell this then to a random crowd walking in the subway or walking down Market Street or walking on the streets of Germantown. I'm telling you, for you are important. You are the people to do this. Are there enough? <laughs> there will be more. There will be more who come to the center. But you are the beginning. Jack, did you think that they would... They would try to kill you if you let the information out? Did you know they were going to try to assassinate you? Yes. Why did you do it? <laughs> I mean, that's a really hard decision. It was a point of principle at, at one time that I needed to make the, the judgment or decision to leak some information out or to call these men upon the rug. It was my ethical duty to do so. Jack, have you made yourself known to us um, telepathically in any of us at all? No, not really. There may have been moments in which Ascordia had relayed my image or vision to several of you, but I have not made personal contact. Do you plan to do this in the future? Yes, I do. How can we work when you were <laughs> Um, is a lot of this censorship to do with the arts, such as the mm, some, some of this, yeah, the maple Thorpe stuff, the you know gay love and stuff like that. Is that sort of the kind of thing that we can fight in a way, which is the beginnings of censorship? It seems like the beginning was used to the idea of censorship, which was really not cool to begin with. Yes, this is one of the examples. 
of an even greater concerted effort at general censorship. You will find it happening in subtle ways. Certain papers will be bought up and never heard of again. Certain magazines will suddenly go bankrupt, and that's how censorship will occur. Jack, uh, I've heard Robert Oshley talk, and he thinks that he's being allowed to release some information. Could you talk on that, and is there any danger to him if he says too much? I knew Bob. We talked before when he was a young man, a much younger man. And I've had conversations with him telepathically. I have had then some telepathic communication then with some individuals, but for the most part, not. In his case, yes, he is being offered the opportunity to express information because he has bought his freedom in a matter of speaking. He has also agreed not to say certain things as well. So in a sense, he is a patsy still to the CIA, but he is allowed to say certain things, for they know that certain amounts of information needs to be leaked out in order to allow people to feel that they have some understanding. So they will not rise up and organize completely against them the efforts of the CIA. They are very shrewd, they are very clever in this fashion, very Machiavellian. It almost seems a little hopeless in a way. I mean, it's, it, it just seems like there's so much overwhelming odds there. And there are not overwhelming odds. They are just accumulating odds due to the lack of understanding, the apathy, and the general mismanagement of public opinion. It seems as though uh, the media um, are, are totally uh, controlled by all the news networks. And I, and I believe the polls are controlled. Uh, I, I believe when they say the Bush is in the lead, uh, I believe they may not even have been but they were just making it seem that way so others would jump on the bandwagon. Are you in concurrence? Yes, absolutely. And this has happened for some time, ever since Nixon, that the, the media coverage has become more and more controlled then by the White House itself, by these agencies, by these men in black suits, shall we say. What functions do, do these agents have in the White House? They belong to various committees, Senate subcommittees. They belong to various trade groups, the Majestic 12. They are assigned positions through nepotism. They are members of boards of directors. There are various people. They are also CIA and FBI agents who are given certain assignments or tasks. Then to the press, to the media, to government, to business. That is all I will tell you now. For the, per the point, then, of my coming today is not to be a doomsayer, not to be a naysayer, not to say it is hopeless that you are subject to such forces of doom and despair, but to say that you have the power, you have the constitutional powers, to uphold and defend your freedoms of speech, freedoms of press, freedoms to pursue life and liberty and happiness in your own fashion, freedom to express your truth so that these forces, shall we say, of dark, of the dark, will not take over as completely as they would like to. This is just then a political level that I address. It is not a social or spiritual level that I address today, for that is not my forte. That is not my interest. I was a political man, and so I give you my political view. Uh, John, Ramsa, and Ola, these are various couple of entities that come through uh, a couple of channels. They also thought about the gray men, the, the various families that uh, control or control the purse strings of the world economy. And um, 
mentioned a couple of names such as the Lost Childs and the Rockefellers. Uh, did you know them and did you know other family members that were influential in the uh, behind the scenes workings and manipulations of this country? Yes, many. DuPonts, mm -hmm. the Pews, mm -hmm. Mellons. I heard it was Jewish families that were the top, top. Is that so? The Rothschilds are oh. a Jewish family. The Rothschild burgers. There are others then, the southern aristocrats also. There are many southern families very much involved in the military. What do you, what do you suggest we do with this awareness that you are now presenting to us? I pinpointed a three-point plan. Oh, okay, so you're going to plan <laughs> Jack, here, John. Excuse Jack, me. Uh, because you're oriented and comfortable with politics, do you see our activities and our own process and our explorations as being having a politic of itself. Yes, but I do not wish to explore that with you. That would be something that you would explore naturally amongst yourselves, especially when you begin to organize. Your personal issues will also become to the forefront. But that is for Escordia and others to reckon with. I need now to take my leave as this channeler has become tired and I am very happy to have made contact here. I look forward then to working with you if Escordia allows me to and if others also deem it fit in my training at this time. I've loved my country I loved being president. I truly loved it. And I want to impart to all of you the same love of your citizenship, then, of the United States, to truly embrace your responsibilities as citizens of this great country. And I leave you with these words, and good luck to all of you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And uh, help to the chief, Jack. <laughs>